make sure it reconnects because everything hates us. It's going really well today. Just choice, my friend. All right, it looks like we're... No, that's a clip of something. Where is that? I don't know if we're back up. Well, we'll see. I think it should tell me that we're live again, but it's being really, really dumb. Or Ben will let us know. Oh, Ben's not in there. Ooh. So I'm trying to use my phone to let us know that okay yep we are live cool so this is just going swimmingly this episode's not going to be on youtube i'll tell you that this is, <laughs> for those watching live this is you're the ones getting this the one and only this is as good as you're gonna get uh we are a well-oiled machine right now a broken machine um oh you know what i could do which might be smart is i could just unplug my xbox for the moment Ow. on a production meeting <laughs> you know in the middle of just doing things it's fine I'm gonna, I'm gonna just go ahead and do that so what were we talking about uh how the nchc tournament is more difficult to win than the ncaa tournament oh yeah yeah i mean you have to look at it and especially this year we had four of the teams that were competing for the frozen face-off tournament champion we're, we're top 10 teams um I don't, you didn't see that in any of the other tournaments out there no, and and just throughout the whole year, all the teams, I, you have four or five teams in the top 10 and six in the top 15. Oh, yeah. You don't see that in any other conference. No, not by a long shot. Um, and then there was the, the Friday game for Western was a really good game. And, oh, we should mention that, you know, Ryan Fancy did shut out the one of the top scoring offenses in the country in Denver. You know they have a player who has the let me see the points leader this year with like forty some assists. I think he has fifty total points. Um, and then and then on back to back nights was able to also keep a team with the leading goal scorer in the country, Ethan Frank, at, with twenty six goals off the scoreboard as well. So. You know, the big, big time show up for the defensive guys, but. And I, I will say on that, on the UMD game against Denver, the, the parts that I saw, it did seem like a very defensive game, kind of like I expected that it was going to be. Uh, it was one nothing going into third, and it ended up 2 nothing on an empty net goal. That, <clears throat> that, uh, that just proves that these are two teams that know each other very well. And yeah, there were some high scoring games during the year, but they know when to lock it down. It, it just so happened that UMD was able to push one past and then get the, the empty netter. But that's a testament to the players and the coaching as to what we talked about last week. This UMD team, there's a lot of players that have been here before, a lot of players that have made the Frozen Four this is the time they know they need to lock it down and actually shine. Yeah, I don't. I think I think they just scored late in the third. I don't think they had an empty netter. Cause uh, I, was, I, have, cause I think it was two zero for a little yeah. while, and I was waiting to see if they might risk it pulling the goalie early. Um, I could be wrong. No, but. it's uh, it's as an empty net. Uh, nineteen thirty nine of the period. Oh, okay, yeah, maybe I'm wrong. I'm probably wrong. You uh, are wrong. <laughs> I don't remember it, but I might not have been watching at that point. I might have. Um, been doing something else, but I was still listening. Um, and then Friday between Western and North Dakota, it was it was really our young guys that showed up, and it was some dirty goals and and some grit, because North Dakota scored first, and we we've seen that that Western doesn't necessarily mind being down one zero or or even two zero at times. Um. So you know, and then we fought back from that, and it was guys like Ty Glover, who's only a sophomore, and then our other goal scorer is another younger guy. Um, Josh Basalt was able to get another assist, so his career assist totals in the the playoffs continue to add up. But it wasn't you know our big name guys or or our senior class that was really leading the charge. It was 
guys that are going to be here still for a couple more years. And and when you when you have depth like that, I think it it, it shows the program's going in the right way. Because yeah, it's good to have a good senior class, but you really want to see the younger class kind of at this time of the year start to take over and, and show that they're moving the program forward. Yeah, Deb, you always want to you want to lean on your your elder statesmen, but at the same time, you know they're going to be there and they can come through when when push to, comes to shove. But if you're getting the production from the younger guys, that that helps the senior class, the juniors and the seniors, the upperclassmen feel a little more relaxed. They don't have that pressure on them, like oh god. We got to carry these idiots now again through everything. It's all right. You know, they can score too. Now we have three, four lines rolling instead of just us two. Right. For sure. Uh, and then going into Saturday, you know, Western and Duluth, they had met four times in the regular season. It was another regular season split. Um, all four teams that were coming in, I believe, had split with the team they were playing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so ev- every match was a, a rubber match to decide the the season series, if you will. Um, and it really, I think, it came down to the big game experience of guys like Ryan Fanti, um, the the UMD defense, and then honestly, on the other side, a lack of big game experience, even from uh, a senior heavy class where we just haven't been in these situations. You know, this is. This was the first time we'd made it to the, the finals. Uh, it was the first time we made it to the semifinals since, like, 2018 or 17, I, I believe it was. Um, so, so those kinds of things, I think, played a role, and you could kind of see it as UMD started to take more and more charge throughout the game and, and really control the pace of the game. And then the timely saves by Fanti, you know, on the first breakaway of, like, three minutes into the game, you know, if... if we are a little more composed in that situation. Maybe Drew can can lift the puck a little bit more, and maybe he it makes it one zero Western early, as opposed to Ryan getting the incredible stop, you know, and keeping the puck out on the on the second and third chances, and then leading eventually to a UMD to go up one zero. So you know, things like that. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> that first goal by by Dominic James. Holy crap! Was that a shot? There was there was nothing, absolutely nothing Brandon Bussey could do. I don't even know if he saw the goal because if you watch the replay, he stands there for a couple extra seconds. Like, did the puck go near me? Was it in this vicinity anywhere? Oh, it's in the net. Okay, cool. And and even one of the camera angles, it, you can't really tell there's room to shoot. So no. I don't know how he got it in there short side. I mean, it was... I think he maybe had half an inch either way and it either hits Bussy or it hits the crossbar that that's how close it was. Um, so nothing you can do about that. And of course that was on the, the far side for, for me cause I screwed up in the tickets and so you I, were sitting near the lost and lunatics. No, no, they, Oh, they were on the other side. Okay. Yeah. They, they were on the side. I was on the end, but it was like, they, they kind of got hosed too because they had to, had to watch UMD score twice on that. Yeah, yeah. It was. I think they they kept Western on the away side of the ice with the home jersey, so it was weird. Yeah, it it was weird, and, and that's how I was going about it. I'm like, well, they should be the home team, so. Yeah, I don't know why they didn't get yeah. the the home side bench, but whatever. I mean, it is what it is. Uh, it was going to be a slightly more UMD crowd than, than Western crowd. But I will say there was a pretty good showing of Lost and Lunatics, and, and a lot of that probably did have to do with you know the arrangements made by the coach and, and our, our new athletic director. So uh, tops to them for getting a Western conglomerate out there, um, especially under you know the short timeline that they, they had to do it. Awesome. And- it, was, it was really cool to see. Honestly. Yeah, and it did make for a, a fun atmosphere where it wasn't um, when UMD scored or did something right where all you were hearing was the UMD crowd and then, you know, if something went 
against Western. It wasn't like five fans that are spread out amongst the arena booing the ref or whatever. There was a good section. Um, there was a good, good cheering section. And it also made it fun because we have a good, I, I won't call it quite a rivalry yet because we haven't faced each other that much in these, uh, these big situations, but a good healthy competition where there's UMD fans next to Western fans and you can just talk with them. Uh, you're, you're not going to want to punch them in the face after about 30 seconds. <laughs> um, so it did make for a fun, fun atmosphere. Um, Casey, I think the power play and then I think it was in the second period that, um, no, it was in the third period, but the, the power play goal hurt you early in the second period that, that UMD got by Casey Gilling. And then in the third, kind of earlier in the third, that save that Fanti made, Western was on the push and it was a wide open net. He got that with the heel of the thumb of his glove, and I don't know how that didn't go in. I, th- I you know, the thing I think I mentioned this to you yesterday. I think when we were talking, it might have been Sunday. I know it wasn't. It had nothing to do with like preparing for the show or anything. Because spoiler alert, we don't prepare much. Uh, yep. <laughs> but, <laughs> we come in and wing it. Yeah. Um, but I was. I think I was talking about like. If he tries to shoot that more short side, mm-hmm. it, it probably misses Fanti's glove. Uh, but he, he looks like he's trying to go back more towards the open net uh, and more with the middle of his his stick. So, and he doesn't. I mean, he doesn't really have a lot of time to make a decision, so he's just trying to put it on net. Right. But he he puts the puck tends to go more to his left, which is back towards Fanti, which is his wife think he gets it with you know the thumb or the heel but if he's able to kind of pull the puck a little bit more and go short side with it it might have snuck in there but it was an absolute incredible play and and and, i mean tops to fanti for making it um yeah and that's that's part of I, i think a lot of the big saves um i won't say all of them because yeah there are some incredible ones that it's the goalie actually doing things right like they have time to make the reaction but a lot of a lot of big saves that you see at any level is just kind of luck and and where it shot i thought that same thing too because there was still a lot of room on the right side of the net Mm -hmm. and then the funny part about the arena was we all thought it was saved and then the goal horn goes off and then everybody's confused. We're like, yeah, he sa- did he save that or didn't he? It looks like he saved it. And as soon as it was confirmed and we saw the replay, even the Western fans, they were just, they, our minds were blown on how that didn't go in. Right. And that, killed basically any momentum that western had for the rest of the game yeah it, it, it definitely looked like it sucked the, the the emotion out of the broncos um, and you can't blame the kids that, no and, but, i would have, to have the same thing like what do we have to do to buy a goal here yeah and, and i think part of that is like i said the inexperience of being in these big time games uh but i also think it was and the broadcast team mentioned this too, and I, and I tended to agree with them that this might be the one. It's a learning opportunity for the Broncos. It's it's a big stage, um, you know, in a very tough tournament, potentially the toughest tournament we're going to play in all year, including the finals or the NCHC tournament. Um, but it's it's how you respond in those situations. So how do we come back and how do we practice? This might be a, a good time for us to lose, and it just as the extra kick in the pants, like, okay, we can't take anything lightly. We have to take take it all as seriously as we can because this is this is what we came back for if you're the, the senior class or the, the graduate students or, you know, those older transfer kids at, at some universities. Like, these are the moments that you're playing for. This was the goal. And even in the, like, hype video that Western put out before, then there's a clip with 
Fershweiler in in the dressing room. And it, even before the game, like it hit me kind of weird that he's like, our ultimate goal isn't here this weekend. It's in Boston. So it's like kind of like, did we overlook the NCHC tournament? Not necessarily in a negative way, but, you know, just in a way of like, we're not done doing what we need to do yet. But, you know, yeah, that's ha- having that in your mind too, like watching it again now that we've lost, it was kind of like, okay. Were we 100% in and focused on this game as we should have been? And and maybe that's where the loss comes in, like, oh, we were more worried about the next game or the next series or the next tournament. I mean, we're 100% in on this. So, you know, the end goal is always probably to win a national tournament, no matter what. Like, you can win your conference tournament or you can win the, the regular season for your conference, but that, that end tournament at the end of the year is probably what most of the kids play for, but you have to keep in, in mind, like, the next game is the most important game because it's the game that we have right now. Yeah, and I mean, who who doesn't like winning? So that, I, I think that's kind of an odd statement. Yeah, I it wasn't going to get you a higher seed, no. whether you won or you lost. Um, and it, so I, I kind of understand it to that extent of our main goal is to get to Boston and then win in Boston. But at the same time, it's a hell of a lot more fun to raise a trophy than to sit and watch the other team do, raise the trophy. <laughs> right. It, it doesn't quite make sense to me. I, I will say, I think that this team is going to be there again next year. And I think, or at least have a good chance to be there again next year with the way that our upper, our second tier players, not second tier players, but our, our younger guys showed up and developed and, and played and, and took control of games throughout the season uh yes we're gonna miss the hard shots of guys like michael joyall and ethan frank and and the passing abilities of josh basalt and and his toe drag and his ability to get around guys because even he i think had an opportunity in that duluth game to to pull one around somebody and just missed the or the puck got away from him i think it was Mm -hmm. um so yeah we're gonna miss things like that but at the same time you know Guys like Ty Glover are making a name for themselves, standing in front of goalies and, and putting back dirty goals like he did on uh, North Dakota Friday night. Um, guys like Luke Granger, who can seemingly put the puck in the net from any angle, like he did in his uh, hat trick night, you know, the, in the first round of the playoffs. So we're we're getting production from all four lines and and able to piece together the younger guys with the, the senior abilities and, and now more guys have experience in big time games so I, I, I like where we're going um, it would have been nice to, to have raised a trophy but I hope it just makes the guys hungrier to, to lift the one at the end of the year going going back to the the experience and gaining the experience I think this does help your team just getting to that game because you look at we've what we've done in the past few years in winning the the conference tournament and then getting to the Frozen Four, losing once in the championship game, winning the national championship back to back, and then losing in the semifinals last year. You get that experience. And all of a sudden, it starts the old. It, it's the trickle down. The older guys have the experience; they can teach the younger guys. The younger guys get that experience, and then it keeps just building on each other. And all of a sudden, you have a perennial power, which is what we are right now. The regular season doesn't matter as much. It does because you need to get into the tournament, and you want to have a good seed in the conference tournament going into the first weekend. Because, yeah, it would suck to go on the road. But you still have that experience where the guys can go in and say, all right, well, we're the fourth seed. We're the fifth seed. We're the sixth seed. These guys had a good regular season. Now is the time where we show where the team that we truly are, the experience that we have. You go, you beat, you 
upset in, in this year. Neither St. Cloud or UMD were really a fifth seeded. No. They were both four seeds. But you go and you get that upset, and then you come into the conference, the semifinals and finals, and you show, okay, yeah, that's cute that Denver and North Dakota won the Penrose Cup. That's really not what we're here for. We're here for the tournament, and then ultimately wherever the Frozen Four is in that national championship. Yeah, I think there was someone who mentioned that, like, last year was the first year that a team won both the Penrose and the NCHC tournament being North Dakota. Which, I mean, you could kind of say that North Dakota had a little bit of a, a leg up because it was in Ralph Engelstead Arena and they were able to start getting fans back in the building. And mm-hmm. North Dakota's hard to play at home. But generally, like, the team that, that wins the regular season is not the team that's that's lifting the Frozen Faceoff trophy. And in fact, the, the two teams that split it the Penrose this year, North Dakota and Denver were both eliminated in the semis. So, you know, it's another year where that it's not the case to win the turn, the conference in the regular season. You, you still have to play that much better in, in the tournament. So I, I, yeah. I think every year we're going to see this conference just get better and better. Um, we're going to see teams kind of cycle through that, that four, four through six spot um, and, and maybe even a little bit higher you know Western was picked to finish sixth in the conference I had them pretty squarely at third and they, they hung at third most of the year uh, so it's really just a any team one through eight in this conference can be good at any given time and anyone can get on a hot streak and like we talked about last week look at what Colorado College did against North Dakota. It was almost Western CC. Yep. It it's and like you said, cycling between the four through six. Omaha right now they're kind of that perennial six six seed going into the tournament, but they're good enough to beat a team in a series, and they're only going to get better, especially when kids see. Okay. You know, we got a better shot at, at at being recognized here because it's the best conference. We're going to play a higher, higher level of hockey. I think we're going to see a lot more of, you know, even Miami getting there. Colorado College, they will, they will draw kids. They have a history. They were in the WCHA. They were a pain to play against. They were very good. So I think you're going to see all of the, the remaining three teams outside of the top five start to pull even closer. And you might see a Western finish in eighth. You might see a, a UMD finish in eighth. But it's going to be a lot closer than it is now, and it's going to be a crapshoot for, you know, the eight versus one. It's not going to be uh, a Michigan versus a – it's not gonna be a Minnesota a Minnesota State versus oh, oh yeah St. Thomas. St. Thomas yeah it's not gonna be Mankato versus St. Thomas it's it's yeah. gonna be it's gonna be a grind though it, and gonna make that tournament even tougher to win uh, I think and and that, that that just makes it a better conference and it better prepares you for non conference tournaments like the NCAA championship tournament where if tournaments like the the GLI come back and, and the icebreaker tournaments at the beginning of the year and, and things like that. So mm-hmm. it, it just helps build every program the better the conference does. You know, a rising tide rises all ships. So if the better that we can be and the more dominant we can be as a conference, the better it makes the conference. And, you know, at one point we've won, what, three of the last five national titles? Yeah, four of the last five, something like that. Four of the last five. I know three out of the last four for sure. So um, I think it's four out of the last five because North Dakota won it, then Denver, then UMD twice, and then yeah. UMass beat St. Cloud last year. So and, and St. Cloud has a, an additional title under the NCHC banner. I think we have five in the 
nine years we've been a conference. Um, so, so, you know, I mean, the conference is, is doing, I think the conference is performing better than they expected. The, the, the conference came out and became the, the Vegas Golden Knights of, if you were to make one team out of a conference, except we actually win championships as opposed to, to Vegas who made it, but couldn't, couldn't get it done. Uh, and that's the thing with everybody that, that was a WCHA team, regardless of your fan base, we looked at it and said, good riddance gophers. You're making a huge mistake because you have one of the best conferences. And now you're putting us plus with, um, us, Denver, CC, Cloud, I think Omaha. Omaha, North Dakota. Yeah, Omaha, North Dakota. And then adding Western and Miami. And you guys were pretty good, too. All right. <laughs> we'll take that. Yeah, I mean, Miami, Miami, Western and Miami had closed out the old CCHA as, as champions. Uh, Western won it in 2012. Miami won it in 2013. And then we came over to the NCHC, and I think Miami was in the finals that very first season. So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, no, we de- they definitely took the, the the teams that were near the top of their conference the year before, and we became the, it just became this juggernaut of a conference. Uh, however, while we're on, or previously on the subject of the Vegas Golden Knights, I think we should give a, a shout-out to Isaiah Seville, formerly of the Nebraska Omaha Mavericks, who signed as a goalie to the Las Vegas Golden Knights. Uh, so he'll be moving on to the next level. And Tyler Ward also signed a contract from Omaha, so he'll be oh. uh, headed to the, the, the next level. I don't remember who his was with, but those are the two that I've seen so far coming out of teams that didn't make the tournament and were NCHC teams that have had players sign professional contracts in the last week or so. Um, and even that, I think, helps the conference as a whole because you're seeing that the nchc is a pipeline to the nhl or to the the professional ranks in some regard yeah it it definitely helps when kids sign contracts even whether they were drafted or not a lot of these scouts take notice especially in this conference and as soon as you're done hey come here come play you don't have to leave early. Uh, and I know we've talked about this a, a few times where they definitely take notice. And just because your team's not moving on doesn't mean you can't move on. If you play to your highest level and teams like you, yep, for sure. then yeah, you move on. Yeah, I'm not looking forward to the guys I think are going to move on early this year. I'm, I'm, this is probably Ronnie Adder's last year in the college ranking. Uh, we, we've seen that he's definitely... Uh, heads and shoulders above most of the defensive players in in the college ranking. Um, now, would I selfishly would I like him to stay a Bronco for one more year? Yes. Does it seem like it's feasible for him to do so? No. I think at that point maybe we start hurting his development. Um, I mean, he's still not like a super old older player because i mean there's some older players in college hockey mm-hmm. let's the college hockey rules are, are weird as far as you know who, who can play and, and how old Wait. they are Juniors and juniors and no um you know you come into, you come into the league as a freshman at 22 sometimes and, and you stay until you're 26 like there's been a couple guys who've done stuff like that so um but yeah i think he's he's nearing the end of his college career uh and and good on him I think he'll do. I think he'll do pretty good at the next level, and and we might see him appear in some NHL games. Um, there, there was talk that David Starman was kind of implicating that Brandon Bussey might be done after this year, and I don't know that that's necessarily the right move. I think he's made a lot of big steps and and, and huge progression from his freshman year to the, to this year, but he also missed an entire year. Mm-hmm. And, and I think there's things he can still learn from the college game. Um, being a little, I think there's still room for him to, to learn to be more comfortable and to settle, to be more settled 
a little bit, and, and he did. He kind of got antsy in that Minnesota State game or that Minnesota game. Um. So I, I don't want him to necessarily leave just yet. I think I think he can still grow a little bit in the college ranks. Um. And, and just going back to Adder, watching him play live. You could tell he had a lot of skill, and you could tell how good he was. I don't think offensively, one of the best defensemen I've seen recently offensively is Perunovic, just partly because I watched him a bunch, but partly even just watching him on TV. You could see an open play, but he would also see it too, and his vision on the ice was so good and adder is right up there i wouldn't put him on the same level but maybe just that next tier down uh because he does have that skill and he has that vision as a passer he he was fun to watch on saturday and he's got he's got good instincts of when he can jump into a player when he needs to play a little bit back or when to look for the the big clap rocket or or you know kind of fake it out and wrist pass it to the to the slot to get someone else an opportunity so he definitely has good instincts and in, in, in hockey IQ. Um, like I said, I don't know if staying another year kind of hurts his progression in that if he can be this dominant player, does it, you know, what does it do to his ego? Like, he's like, oh, I can walk in on anybody and kind of do what I want. And maybe moving up to, to a higher level kind of keeps him in check but allows his game to progress to the next level in, in he gets kind of hit with the, the speed that the NHL game has compared to the college game or the AHL game has compared to the college game. I think it would benefit him to, to leave and go up to the AHL and, and get a year or two there, maybe three, depending on where he goes. Is, is he a draft pick? I'm uh, not yeah, sure. He was drafted by Philly. So then he has a chance to play yeah. uh, after a year or two. They're, they're not going to, unless they completely – by half the NHL defensemen. <laughs> or, you know, just sell off prospects. It is Philly. Philly does some weird stuff. I don't I don't know what Philly does. Especially when they have Chuck Fletcher as the GM right now. Uh, but I think it's time that we get to the bracket. Um, and, and, yeah, I have mine printed out. I just don't have it filled out because uh, I wanted to talk about some stuff. There's also another point made during the broadcast, and I know I keep bringing up the broadcast, but it's because I watch the games and I pay attention to the, the things the announcers say, and, and some of their topics are interesting. They mentioned, I think, I want to say it was, it might have been Alex who mentioned this, but they, they mentioned, like, the big win like of why, like, Western might be able to pull out the, the, the win in the title game because they didn't have that signature win throughout the season. And it was, they, they kind of gave Minnesota Duluth's win or sweep of St. Cloud like a little bit more importance than they probably could have or should have in the in the semifinals. But Western didn't really have like a statement win this year. Um, yeah, we swept North Dakota, but it was, it was on home ice. And, and we were a team that was pretty hot in the running at that point. Um, and so what I did is I looked at everything... Kind of the biggest moment in everybody's season thus far to see like how they all kind of stacked up and, and, and what stood out where. So as we go through the, the bracket and, and picks, I think I'll mention like what the, the big standout to me was so far this season for each team. And then and, and kind of discuss the teams as we go and see if we can come up with potentially the same picks or, or see where we differ on things. And I'll just go off my logic which was basically no logic at all except for what i thought of teams how the teams that i've seen play um and how they played versus what i kind of know of teams yeah which i texted you this earlier i only know about 65 percent of the teams and those would be the nchc teams no uh, we don't make up that that much of the tournament, but or I, I don't I don't know sixty five percent of the teams. Yeah, yeah, that might be we know only the NCFC teams. Um, but the first matchup in the Allentown, Pennsylvania region, which I don't is 
I'm not sure which one that is. They don't say what directional they that, are. They just that is the top quarter. Yeah. Um, but I meant like as far as northeast, southwest, they don't have those kind of names. They're just oh, yeah. whatever seeds. So well, then, it's basically three quarters east, one yeah. far. Away. Yes. <laughs> Uh, the number one seed in the tournament to overall, U of M, the University of Michigan, for those who may also live in a state where their main university may be a U of M, like people from Minnesota, or uh, taking I, I, on American International. And so I, I'm, I think this one's probably pretty obvious to most people, um, being that Michigan is the number one overall seed in American Atlantic, I think is probably the lowest seed on mm-hmm. on here. Uh, and they got in through an automatic bid of winning their their tournament championship. They won the the uh, Atlantic Hockey Tournament, so that's their you know their big statement win of the year, if you would say so. And Michigan won the Big Ten tournament after failing to capture the Big Ten regular season title. Um, Michigan's got that stacked roster of NHL draft picks and, and guys who were in World Juniors and, and on Olympic teams, both U.S. Canada for sure, and, and maybe even some others. Um, but it looked like American International did not have a bad season. I don't know that they necessarily play in, in one of the toughest conferences. They play in a, in a decent conference. You know, they've got teams like the Air Force, Army, who play extremely well-conditioned games and, and can go for 60 minutes, but they may not produce the, the high scores that other conferences do. Uh, but I do have Michigan moving on in the first round. Um, for, for that game, Michigan, I do have them moving on. But I debated this one a little bit because American International has some kids that are back that – Beat, beat both St. Cloud and Mankato, I believe, as the number 16 seed in the tournament. I believe it was been the 18, 19, or 17, 18, and 18, 19 tournaments, or maybe it was 18, 19, and then 20, 21. They beat the number one seed. So there are going to be kids that have that big game experience that have been there for it, upsetting at least one of them. So I don't think it's going to be as easy as Michigan is probably thinking, and they might overlook them a little bit. And Michigan Michigan has struggled at times. I mean, they, they lost all four games to – or they lost all four regular season games to Notre Dame. Uh, and they, they lost a, a close game. Actually, no, it wasn't that close of a game to Western, but they lost a game to Western in on home ice in Ann Arbor and went to overtime on a somewhat controversial goal before getting the win in Kalamazoo. So, I mean, they've had struggles with teams that may or may not be deemed lesser than them. Uh, and, and you can't count out any of the 16 teams in this tournament, but I, I do think at this time we're going to see the firepower of, of U of M step up and, and take a little bit more charge and, and they're going to use that experience of playing in these, these bigger tournaments like the Olympics and the world juniors to their advantage. Yeah. I think it's going to be closer than people expect it to be. I still think Michigan gets through. I, I think it's going to be a one or a two goal game instead of a three to five goal game. Like most ex experts would predict people that actually watch these East coast hockey teams. Unlike us. Right. Uh, next in the same regional is Quinnipiac and St. Cloud. Both are teams that have had Final Four appearances in the last little while. Um, I think Quinnipiac won one not too long ago, or maybe before the the NCHC run. They were a either a champion or, or a, at least a Frozen Four appearance. Yeah, they um, were a Frozen Four team for sure. St. Cloud, you know, made it to the, the Final Four last year. Um, National Championship last year. Yep. So, um, the the two big wins that I saw this year was Quinnipiac was able to pull out the ECAC regular season title. And honestly, I think 
even though the, the first round of the NCHC playoffs did not go the way they were hoping, I think the biggest win for St. Cloud this, this year was to earn home ice for the NCHC tournament by, by getting that one last big win in Duluth uh, at Anzoil Arena against the Bulldogs. My my thought on this one, I had, I had Quinnipiac moving on, but that's a lot of me not knowing how they are and going off their record. They could have a very fast team that St. Cloud could neutralize, but that's not... St. Cloud has some speed, but... They, if Quinnipiac is faster than them, I don't think they know how to neutralize it as well, where the close games that they played with UMD, it was more UMD neutralizing them and not being as high-powered. St. Cloud has a high-powered offense. I just don't think that they have enough. And it also depends on if Rennick is healthy or not. I know he was sick in the first round, they said it was non-COVID related, but it depends if they have Rennick or not. That That's going to be a big deal for them. I think the series might have gone three if they had Rennick um, and if they had played the right way. Oh, yeah, they... We'll see. I have, I have Quinnipiac winning that game, but that's more of a crapshoot on my part. I forgot about uh, St. Cloud not having their goalie for the first round of the NCHC playoffs. Mm-hmm. Um, I did look at a little bit of Quinnipiac's record. They started out the season, you know, super strong. Uh, they had a split with North Dakota early in the year. Um, they look like they're able to beat teams they're supposed to beat. I don't want to say their conference is super, you know, it's not super strong as far as how it ranked in, in the rankings throughout the season. Um, you know, they they have a lot of teams that struggled this year. It, it felt like like we didn't hear much about. Um, and the thing that I, I was leaning towards St. Cloud in this one, just because like they they took this hard loss to UMD. They might be a team that they've they're a team that had an extra week to prepare for the tournament. Whether it was necessarily like they, I mean, they didn't know who they were playing for sure, but they had an extra week of practice to to get things right. Um, they're coming out of the NCHC, which I think you, you kind of have to give any team that comes out of this conference a chance to, to win. Their upperclassmen literally were just in the, the championship game last year. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think I'm going to stick with my, my pick of St. Cloud, even though you know I completely forgot to take into account their goalie. I, I just think the the strength of schedule that St. Cloud plays does a little bit more to prepare them than than Quinnipiacs. Uh, so so that, that's where I'm going to go. So I have Michigan and St. Cloud moving on. So we differ on Quinnipiac and St. Cloud. There's also a little part of me that just hates St. Cloud. Well, enjoys watching St. Cloud lose, but that that's more of a personal <laughs> personal friendship that <laughs> uh, makes it a little more entertaining. All right, moving on to the Loveland out west regional over there in Colorado. We have Loveland host Denver taking on UMass Lowell. And, and I, I think UMass Lowell made a pretty good run last year into the tournament. Um Nothing really stood out as like a defining moment for this year, so so that might be if you, if you care to think about it in those terms, something worth noting. Um, Denver. I think it was a couple of years ago they had a they had a frozen four run last I, I, year. I feel like it was within the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, and, and I know there was a big thing like they they started to make a name for themselves, coming out of the shadow of of UMass. Uh, a little bit there and, and kind of putting the stamp on the fact that you know they, they have their own name to, to stand on and, and weren't going to be the little brother to Massachusetts anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, 
man, Denver is coming off of a tough loss to to UMD. They have the the country leading point scorer with his astronomical amount of assists in I think it's it's Brick something. I can't remember his name, even though he's literally been talked about all season. Um I know it as soon as I see it too. I can't think of it at the minute. They have a, a, a solid goalie in Magnus Corona. He, mm-hmm. He's played super well. Um, I don't. It might be one of those situations where they they want to get back on a winning track. It only takes four wins to win a national title. So if if you can put together four strong performances, which we know that Denver can. Denver played extremely well. Bobby Brink is the nation's leading point getter. Yeah. Uh, who, he can distribute the puck like, like a, I don't know what, what, who he compares to, honestly, the, the dude is the Steve Nash of the Denver pioneers. Uh, he finds open guys who, who can put the puck in the back of the net. Um, they play really well in Colorado. It took most of the, the season for them to, to finally lose on home ice. And while they're not in Denver, they're they're in Colorado and they should have a pretty good turnout for home fans, I would hope. And I think I think Loveland is pretty close. And, and they they know how to play in that kind of situation, you know, up up in the mountains where the air's thin. They're they're going to be having a lot of more East Coast or more Eastern based teams. Uh. So I, I look for Denver to take that first round matchup against UMass. Yeah, let's see. It is currently right now. It's about an hour north of the university because the University of Denver is just a little south of the downtown, and uh, Loveland's just shy of an hour. So they will have their home fans there. Oh, and they took a share of the Penrose Cup. So that's their their big defining moment so far to this point in the season. I took Denver in that matchup. Oh, and another I, team that was in a Frozen Four not too long ago. Lost to your Bulldogs. Did they lose in the Frozen? I know they won the national championship against us. Oh, maybe that's what it was. Or didn't they? Wasn't it back-to-back years and then they lost the second year? Or did you guys beat them in a different round? We beat, we beat Notre Dame one year. I'm trying to think of who we beat the other year. You know, I kind of forgot who we beat just because we won, and I really did not care who we beat. Either way, they the, the recent national champion, a team that, that, that can get there and has gotten there in the past. Maybe not the same players, but a coaching well, – I don't know. I don't even think the coach is the same coach, but a program that has a history of being able to show up when they need to. Let's put it that way. And I, I took Denver fairly handily over that. I, I didn't write down any scores, but I – that was an easy one for me. They're a high-powered offense that is probably very upset losing to UMD in the semifinal round, a team that they know they can beat. And UMass Lowell was in the Hockey East, which was not the conference that it has been in the past. Both I, Anybody who looks at this bracket, they'll notice two mainstays that are not in there in BU and BC. Yep. Both, had, uh, both had off years this year. Mm-hmm. So the Hockey East was not the conference that they have been. Denver is a high-powered offense. And playing in Colorado, they're going to have their home fans there. They're going to put on a show at least for one game. Yep. Uh, and, I, and I think I know why you said that. Because this mm-hmm. next matchup is... Your Minnesota Duluth Bulldogs, who just finished off winning an extraordinarily tough NCHC tournament, uh, taking on the Michigan Tech Huskies. A, a solid team, uh, a team that was able to push a 0-0 tie with a semi, a depleted Michigan uh, in late December. Um, other than that, I mean, not really a lot of standout wins for for the Michigan Tech crew up there. I, I think they just had a solid season. 
they competed against you know the number one team in the country for a long stretch in Minnesota State. Uh, and I then believe they finished number two in the overall. Uh, yeah, I think so. The two seed in the CCHA. Yeah, I think they lost to Bemidji. They they were upset by Bemidji up in uh, Houghton for the semifinals for Bemidji to go play yeah. Mank. Uh, gener- you know, a super solid team for the most part. Uh, I, I haven't seen them play this year. Uh, it would have been nice if, you know, to have gotten a chance to play them. I know Western has played them in the past in, in, in the GLI a, few, a couple times. Um, and then Minnesota Duluth, you know, they're riding a, a super hot goaltender in, in uh, Ryan Fanti. They, they play incredibly well-disciplined defense. Uh, they don't take a lot of penalties. They they've got guys that can put the puck in seemingly no space to score goals. Um, so I have I have Duluth moving on to get a little rematch with uh, Denver. I have UMD moving on as well. Um, actually, I'm trying to think. I think. Okay, yeah, Tech did lose to Bemidji, but I I do have UMD moving on. I just think that the experience comes through. And even though Tech has had a little more time to prepare for the the tournament and get some extra practice in, I just don't think they're going to do it. I, There's no better experience than playing two games back-to-back the way that Minnesota Duluth did. Ryan Fanti had 120 minutes of shutout hockey against two of the most prolific offenses in the in the college ranks this season. Uh, he shut down the country's leading point getter in Bobby Brink, who has, like I said, an astronomical amount of assists. I think it's like over 40 assists this year. I mean, I'm not even joking. Uh, and then shut down the leading goal scorer in Ethan Frank and probably one of the most productive lines that we've seen in college hit hockey in a, in a long time in that first line of Frank, Warad, Gallant for Western Michigan, and on the back end, Ronnie Adderd, who's got a rocket ship at the end of his stick. Uh, and, and I don't think you can say enough about the way that they played. And they were a team that had come off of a loss of, to St. Cloud at the very end of the season to not get home ice and, and ended up sweeping them and swept the entire NCHC playoffs for, for them. So... He's Fancy's going to be one who's hard to get by. And the other, I, I know you use this for St. Cloud, but the other factor is, is the conference. The CCHA is not very strong outside of Mankato, basically. It's. Hey, Ferris has had some good seasons. The, uh, Tech is usually one of those teams who, who's pretty sound. Um, Bemidji made the tournament last year, uh, and they were they were in the was it them that was in the Frozen Four? As well? No, I think they lost to St. Cloud because that one I didn't care really who won or lost because it was going to be a Minnesota team in the Frozen Four. I just wished one of them was going to be in there. We had three out of the four. Yeah, but I think the experience and the conference. And just the style of hockey that's played is also going to come to the forefront. I think it's going to be still a low-scoring game, but that's more UMD imposing their will on Tech than it is teams not being able to score and then then a hot goalie with Fanti. Yeah, and I mean Duluth. Duluth is one of those teams that gets better as the year goes on and they, they show up when the, the, the brights the lights are brightest. They're 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 the bright side of aluminum foil. The the brighter the lights the more they reflect it and and you, you see their bright side. So definitely I see an NCHC rematch there. Uh where are we at now? We are in Worcester, Massachusetts, where the Western Michigan Broncos are the number one seed the first time in program history that they have earned a one seed in the college hockey national title tournament um 
finishing third in the NCHC and, and making their first NCHC Frozen Face Off finals appearance. Uh, it's been a history making season for this Broncos team. Some of it good, some of it bad. We're not going to get into the bad. People who know know how bad that situation is. Um, they have a first year head coach in Pat Fershweiler who has NHL experience as an assistant coach. He's an alumni of Western Michigan. He was here with uh, Jeff Blaschel as when he was a first year head coach and, and got us to the CCHA championship finals. He was here with Andy Murray during Andy Murray's first year when we won the CCHA championship finals. Um, he seems to have put his stamp on this team and, and gotten something a little bit extra out of them in a different way than Andy Murray was able to. They are, you know, incredibly talented from top to bottom. Um, it depends on their ability to play as a team and to make team style decisions. I think sometimes there, there's players on this team who we saw in the NCHC finals made the moment too big for themselves and, and wanted to do too much and it let the game get away from them a little bit. So they, to hopefully learning from that experience, they can reel in their emotions a little bit. Um, they're playing a Northeastern team who finished first in the Hockey East regular season. Outside of that, I don't know a whole bunch about this team. Uh, this is my homer pick. I'm saying Western's winning this one because clearly I think my fandom of this team is pretty well documented. Um, I thought you were a Holy Cross fan. No, oh, for sure. There's always that one person at the tournament. There's always one person that at the Frozen Four that has a Holy Cross jersey, and you're like, "Oh, we found their one fan." Uh, but yeah, that that's that's my homer pick. I think I think we get our first NCAA, NCAA tournament victory this year, um, and but we'll still have work to do. So so we need to keep that in in check. I took Western as well. I just think they're too good of a team to lose in the first round. They're, they're going to respond from that, that loss this last weekend. They're, there's too much talent. They're too good of a team. Again, Hockey East, not what it has been. The Northeastern men could try to vibe off the, the women's team who made their Frozen Four appearance. They did lose to UMD. Which lost to Ohio go. State. Uh, that's a, hey hey, don't shush. I won't shush. I will follow your directions and not shush one bit, sir. But I think Western is just too good of a team to lose to a Northeastern team. That you know, I don't know a whole lot about, but playing their conference schedule with having a bunch of teams that are down that typically are good to have the record they are eh, I, I go western on that one fairly easily and the next matchup is Minnesota versus Massachusetts Minnesota was the regular season Big Ten championship or champions they were able to, to steal that from Michigan um, which I'm completely okay with uh, they Lost to Michigan in the Big Ten tournament this year. Um, in Mariucci, which is kind of funny. Because yes. I, I saw uh, videos of, of Mariucci Arena. That's the most packed I've seen that place in about six years. So that was, I, I enjoyed that quite a bit. <laughs> uh, they're playing Massachusetts, who is the Hockey East tournament champions. They're also defending national champions. And I think this is the only matchup potentially of both conference tournament winners playing each other. Or nope, because Michigan won the, the turn the yeah. conference yeah. tournament. Never mind. Don't listen to me. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um But, you know, so Massachusetts is a team that, that's back in the in the hunt for a back to back national championships. 
I, do, I honestly I don't know much about either of these teams. Um, no. I know, you know, Minnesota's football team has Western's old football coach, so they're gonna be trying to row the boat just like the football team did, because uh, PJ Fleck has an infectious personality that gets into every sports program on campus. Uh, it's happened here. It, it it's probably happening there. That's not necessarily a bad thing, to be honest. And the other thing the Gophers have going for them is Bob Motzko. He's the Gophers coach after leaving St. Cloud. So Brett Larson's in his fourth or fifth season, but Motzko had St. Cloud playing at an elite level and one of the top teams in the NCHC and the WCHA before the NCHC formed before he left and got paid the big bucks by the Gophers. So he, there is also that personality within the hockey team. Not, not even PJ, but Bob as well. He, he's such a great hockey coach. So this, this one I've literally gone back and forth with. I had a bracket with Minnesota. I had a bracket with Massachusetts just because I, I don't really know these two teams. Uh, that I mean, it's a two, it's a two-three matchup as far as like the com, you know, the the regional goes. Mm-hmm. Um, I want, I, I think I'm gonna go Massachusetts just because they have championship experience on on their side as, as far as players on the ice. Um, not that Minnesota doesn't have experienced players I I think there's just a small edge in being the team that's the defending national champions and and, and knowing what to expect and and how to play and and being that they are in Massachusetts I'll give them the home ice advantage and and, and instead of it being you know so maybe that equates to a one goal difference for them but I'm not really picking scores so I will take Massachusetts from that one and I took Minnesota in that one it was a 50 50 for me too. I was looking at last year's bracket and for whatever reason, I thought Massachusetts had beat Minnesota. I, I was just looking at this now that Massachusetts had beat Minnesota, but Massachusetts actually beat the Midgey for nothing before they beat us three to two in overtime after we played our five overtime thriller, we went to overtime again. Uh, Minnesota lost to Mankato. But I haven't watched the Gophers. I know the Big Ten has a weird schedule, and sometimes they broadcast it down here, or it'll be on Big Ten Network, but I'm just not enthralled by Big Ten hockey, so I don't even really watch it. But from what I've heard in the time it's been, Motsko has the players that he wants and to play his style of hockey. And he's the, he's the type of coach and has the experience to get his guys ready to play in a one game tournament. Not to say match Massachusetts doesn't, but I don't know how much they've lost this last year. And then for Minnesota to lose to Michigan in a one game playoff, I think that would probably, they played 10 times. It'd be 50, 50, just Michigan just has a lot higher firepower as far as draft picks go. Yeah. But I'm giving Minnesota the slight edge on that in, in this game. So that's one we're going to differ on. That's who I picked, but I, I was I did look at, you know, who who Minnesota plays in their conference. It's a smaller conference. They're playing they're probably playing teams a lot more than um most and and they do play a pretty good substantial non-conference schedule because of only having seven teams in conference. Um we, we did sweep them when but, they were number four. And, and the the fact that it was just such a, a coin flip I, I literally think it just comes down to the fact that Massachusetts might be able to generate more of a, a home atmosphere. Uh, I don't necessarily know that you're going to get a lot of Minnesota fans making the, the journey out there. I don't think you're going to get a lot of Western Michigan fans making the journey out there just because of, you know it's such a quick turnaround 
to, to, to get there. I think there will be some. Uh, but it, it definitely won't be like playing at Lawson or it won't be like playing at Mariucci or, or at Yoast. Some of these bigger uh, stage advantage stadiums. Um, You're going to get a lot of the retirees that they got money to burn and nothing else to do. So ah, let's go take a vacation out to Massachusetts and watch some hockey and yeah, see I what happens. I don't even know that that's really like a, a winning area to want to go to. Um, but beside the point, you know, well, if, if you're a diehard hockey fan and you follow your team, that's true. like I, I can see you at 75 years old saying, I got money to burn. Let's go do this. Uh, you act like I'll, I'll be there with face paint on at 75. I might have to I know, somebody that's else to do it. But say, it'll gonna, happen. You're going to have your face paint on. Oh, I hope I might have to be buried in that. Um, next yep. up in, in our final region, the Albany region, we have Minnesota State, uh, who were the CCHA regular season and tournament champions. I believe the only program to, to do both. Uh, taking on the Harvard Crimson, I believe is their, their mascot. Uh, Harvard is the ECAC tournament champion. So I believe this is the matchup between tournament champions. Um, Minnesota State has been a team ranked within the top five all year. They had a pretty good grip on the number one spot in a lot of polls for a majority of the year. Uh, they lost to Michigan early in, in the icebreaker tournament. Um, they, I think they lost one other kind of surprise game a, a later in the year. I can pull up their schedule here just to see. But but I can't remember exactly which one it was when I was thinking of it. Um, either way, I had I have Minnesota State winning this one. I'm not going to go too far into the depth of the fact that I had have zero knowledge of, of Harvard or their hockey team. I know in the past they've had some pretty good hockey teams. Um, you know, the East Coast used to be the dominant area for hockey. We're seeing that kind of trickle more and more to it being the NCHC uh, for whatever reason you, you know um, Harvard had a pretty good uh, season again this year that they did win a championship I just think Minnesota's been playing Minnesota State's been playing really good hockey the entire season and I don't really see that stopping in the first round of the tournament no there I, I had Mankato didn't even think twice about moving them. Their, their five losses this year were to St. Cloud, Michigan, Ferris State, who they responded with a 5-1 win after that loss. Lake Superior State, they lost one nothing and responded with a 3 nothing win. And then they lost to Northern Michigan 4-2, I think that they were I think the Northern Michigan one was the one I was thinking of that was pretty surprising. And they had the one thing I will say maybe that's playing with them a little bit is if you were following college hockey Twitter at all this weekend, uh, then you'll know this story. Their championship game mm -hmm. turned into a, a shit show for lack of a better word. Uh they had scored scored the game winning goal in overtime. They had initially reviewed it as a good goal. Over a half hour later, apparently they looked at it again or were still looking at it, and they had different camera angles to show the puck had entered the net illegally under the frame of the net. They had the so they literally had given out all of the trophy tournaments or tournament trophies, uh, the the big trophy for the conf the Mason Cup for the conference, uh, emptied out the stadium, and then made the players redress do a five-minute warm-up, and restart the game with an empty arena to which Minnesota State scored the game-winning goal legally this time and was crowned the champion once again. But just the uh, the ridiculousness of that situation and the inability to get something right the first time 
is, I think is... there are a few people still in the stands there because I did see some Michael Russo. It was some either Star Tribune writer or athletic writer was in Mankato there and he went live and he was there and he was like, well, we got to wait for them to resurface the ice now and everything. Uh, but regardless, it was a mess and it yeah. should not take that long. No. And they, they shouldn't have someone come back a half hour late. That's kind of too long. Like, I'm sorry, you lost. Yes, it's a BS goal, but it is what it is, and, and we're just mm-hmm. going to move on. Um, just a what a sh- crap show that turned out to be. But, Dio. But I do think Minnesota State still comes away with the, the win over Harvard. Oh, yeah, they come away from that because they responded uh, just looking through their schedule. Uh after they lost 4-2 to Northern, they won 4-1. to And then in their – they beat Thomas 3-2, 8-2. And then the semifinals, they just kicked the crap out of Northern Michigan 8-1. to yeah. uh, So they're – they have it together. And they did sweep UMD this year when we played them, which was unfortunate. But I know they're a good team. And – Ryan Sandlin has bragging rights over his dad and tell him next year unless he leaves because Scott Sandlin's kid plays for Mankato because he didn't want to play for his dad. <laughs> and then the final first round matchup is North Dakota versus Notre Dame. This one, once again, was a little bit of a toss up. You do have the co Penrose cup winners in North Dakota. Uh, you have a Notre Dame team that completed a, a, a regular season sweep of Michigan, depending on how you define sweep. Uh, it was two overtime wins early in the season, and then I believe two outright wins later in the season. A win's a win, I don't care. As far as a fan's concerned, a win is a win, whether it's overtime, a shootout, or in regulation. We don't really care about the points associated with it. A win's a win. Yep. Um, so, in, in that regards, like, Notre Dame kind of has that going for it, but North Dakota is one of these perennial powerhouses. They show up when they need to. Um, They're coming off of a loss to to Western Michigan. Their their downside is they're a new team as far as being a team is concerned, but that really hasn't slowed them down at all in the fact that, you know, they were able to – rack up i believe 54 points throughout the regular season in the nchc uh they were you know tied for the mo- the, for points with denver mm-hmm. um part of me doesn't necessarily want to say that another nchc team moves on but i don't know that denver or that notre dame really put up a season that makes me lean hard towards them. So if I like, if it were ten out of, if it were ten game, if it were a ten game series, maybe Notre Dame wins four. I think it's four six in favor of North Dakota. So if it's an eleven game series, it's six five for North Dakota. And, and I think maybe that's enough to to put them into the next round. But that would be, you know, all five. NCHC teams moving on for me, which is not out of the realm of possibilities when you look at how strong that conference is, um, the teams that come out of that conference and, and how they're able to compete and how we compete in a non-conference on the regular anyway. You know, we generally have a pretty solid non-conference schedule as a conference. Uh, we, we tend to win more non-conference games than we lose. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's another toss-up. I think the strength of schedule in the past gives North Dakota a slight edge, but the overall inexperience of that team, having 14 freshmen slash transfer students, but they do have Zach Driscoll, who is a goalie who has competed in the, the top levels of college hockey. He was on that Bemidji State team that played deep in, in a tournament run. He can you know make big saves at big opportunities at big times. Um, 
I don't know a lot about the Notre Dame team to really get into specifics as to which players are good or, or bad or who who needs to step up in that situation. So I guess I go with my gut and my first instinct. And even though I don't really know that it's a big difference in teams, I think I go North Dakota. For me, I this was some of these were easy. This is another one that wasn't easy for me to pick a winner. Uh, North Dakota, they do have that inexperience, and yes, Driscoll, he does have experience, but they're fairly and they inexperienced otherwise. They should be getting Sanderson back, but hopefully his injury situation clears up. Uh, that's why he was missing from the Western game on Friday. Uh, Tyler Clevin will be back after serving his one-game suspension for having accrued three game misconducts, his third one being somewhat controversial. Um, until <laughs> until another one. But, um, Sorry. Sorry. So th- that, kind, that kind of sure that at least helps provide some stability and, and assurance to their back end on the, on the blue line. And maybe those two players are, are kind of what puts them over the edge over Notre Dame. But like I said, I don't follow Notre Dame hockey. I only know that they beat Michigan because anyone who beat Michigan today was on, or this season was on my radar after the the shenanigans that took place with the GLI mm-hmm. and and the first or the, the the second game against Western. Yeah, for sure. The other than the inexperience, and you just kind of alluded to it with getting a couple players back on their back end. I don't know how Notre Dame plays. I, I think I saw them on the big 10 network for about 20 seconds total this year. If they're a gritty team that likes to get in front of the net, what happened against Western Michigan and those dirty goals? I don't think North Dakota can really recover. They, they, North Dakota didn't impress me on clearing the net and giving Driscoll enough room to see the puck. And that's, I lean Notre Dame, but then again, I don't know them. And it's mostly based off of the lack of experience that North Dakota has, but Notre Dame doesn't have that much experience either. So I think this is another one of those toss up games that'll probably come down to the last five minutes, if not overtime, depending on how Notre Dame plays. If they play a gritty Western Michigan UMD style game, then I think Notre Dame moves on with a two goal lead, uh, possibly three with an empty netter. But I, I, ex- I expect it to be a pretty close game. All right, and so now we're back up to the top. Let's go through and, and close out what will be the first round for sure, and we'll, we'll, we'll see how we feel about the rest of these. Uh, we're, we're, this is going to be a long one tonight. <laughs> we're already about an yeah. hour and a half in. Um, so I have Michigan versus St. Cloud going in the second round. Um, I really don't know. Like, I want to see how the games play. Mm-hmm. But I'm not, you know, it would be hard to to get on and, and and really go round by round after watching them play. And the the point of the brackets kind of just to pick it at the beginning all the way through. Um, I think the talent of Michigan might outweigh the experience of Saint Cloud here. But mm-hmm. but it's one of those things where, or does the experience of St. Cloud match the talent of U of M? Because really, the, the second that puck hits the ice, everybody's on even ground, and, and you just have to play and outwork the guy across from you. I believe St. Cloud can win this game, but I think Michigan is going to. And I had Michigan going through, through to the, the Frozen Four even versus Quinnipiac, I thought their firepower was going to be too much, even if for either team, no matter who I picked between Quinnipiac and St. Cloud, uh, I thought Michigan's firepower was going to be a little bit too much. Uh, So I had Michigan moving on. And then Denver, Minnesota, Duluth, a rematch of the semifinals from the NCHC. My brain kind of leads, leans Denver. 
and and I don't know that that uh, Ryan Fanti is going to be able to shut that offense down two weekends in a row. Mm-hmm. Um, I, the uh, play, the offensive abilities at Denver, I think, are just going to kind of they're going to make the adjustments from last week to this week. They're they're two teams that know each other extremely well. It could easily go to overtime, and I would be a hundred percent down with that. It would be a, it's gonna, it would be a fun matchup. It's gonna be a fun. It was a fun matchup. It'll be a fun matchup again. Uh, but I, but I think Denver having the opportunity to face UMD again is gonna take full advantage of that, and they they would come out with a close game win. I went with my heart on this one, um, <laughs> like like you did with the first round homer pick i did pick umd with these two teams it's with the season split and how close they played on friday it can go either way i swear to god if it's another five overtime game like we have with north dakota last year (laughs) um but i I could honestly see it going five overtimes it's going to be a tightly contested game I, I picked UMD to win that game, but that might have been the toughest one that I had to pick because of what's happened this season. I, I literally think that's the, the biggest toss-up game for me, too. Um, it's literally a 50-50 game. Literally, these two teams play each other 10 out of 10, to- or 10 times. Out of- it's they play be 100 five- times. It's, it's gonna, gonna be fifty fifty. It's gonna be yeah. No matter what, like there there are two teams that on any given day either team can win. I, I just think that the adjustments Denver is gonna be able to make, and and they're gonna ride that wave of you're not shutting us out two weekends in a row. We're gonna yeah. put goals on you, and Corona is gonna be like, well, I'm stopping you this week. Plus, I mean, his first name is Magnus. Come yeah. on, yeah. that's. It's a sweet. His name is sweet. <laughs> he, 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 might, he, might, he might. He might. might win the best first name in in the the, the, the best name in college hockey. Right yeah. Uh, and then I have Western Michigan versus Massachusetts. My heart wants to stay Western Michigan. Um, I th- they're a team that's been able to win four games in a row this year against tough opponents. Uh, we've beaten teams that were ranked above us we've beaten teams that are ranked below us we've come out of most series with at least a split i don't know anything about massachusetts though um and it and it kind of scares me i think i just go with the homer pick and i take western michigan but it's, it's honestly just coming from a place where i know this team I know what they're capable of on their best day, mm-hmm. uh, and a total ignorance of Massachusetts, um, and just just my heart of being a Western Michigan fan. Like, as long as they play the best game they can play that we've seen them play this year on multiple occasions, that that strong team defense, the the defense where guys are willing to block shots where our defense transitions to good offense, where we make smart passes, not just passing to pass or passing to be pretty. Uh, when we shoot with intent and and we play smart, we stay out of the penalty box, but we let the other team go to the box. Like These, these are the things that you have to do at this time of the year. It all has to come together this time. And if it can, Western it should, that's should so get crazy. the win. Destroy shit. That's fine. It's just cords falling and scaring my poor little cat. Uh, then Western can win. And I, I have Western beating Minnesota. Uh, a lot of that had to do with, well, first of all, me choosing Minnesota, but then UMD sweeping Minnesota and playing the same style of hockey as Western does. I don't think Minnesota can play that way. There, it, it just makes them un- uncomfortable. And so I had Western Michigan moving on just based off of that uh, versus Minnesota. It, 
to sweep the number four team in the country. Yeah, it was a little earlier on. Um, but they were still the number four team in the country, and we made them uncomfortable, and they want to have that open freestyle of game. And it, it was a home-and-home home series, so I, I think Mariucci is a little bit bigger than – or a little different dimensions than Amsoil. As newer arenas are built, they're all of the same dimensions, but they're, as of right now, college hockey has a few different dimensions. And I just think Western has the advantage on the style of play. And so I have them moving on. And then Minnesota, North Dakota, or Minnesota State, North Dakota, my bad. I keep calling Minnesota State, Minnesota. Um, Call them Mankato, even though that's not how they wrote it. Uh, That's all I know. <laughs> we, I think, we, we call by the cities. <laughs> I think I think these two teams played each other earlier this year. Uh, I, I want to say Minnesota State got the better of it. Um, let's um, see. I'm not entirely sure. Again, think... this is a situation where I have North Dakota. I think their defensive pairings are uh, good. No, be they their, not... their... Oh, Okay. Are going to be their biggest strength, uh, just because of the talent they have there and the skill set that, the, that those guys bring. Um, again, not really. I mean, Minnesota State has been the, at the top of the rankings all year long. I don't think you can. You don't. That doesn't happen by chance. Um, you can say yes, it's because they play a quote-unquote weaker conference um but you still have to win those games and Mm -hmm. and they were winning those games by large margins there there was there wasn't a lot of one zero games against teams in their conference uh it was multiple goal differential for a large part they played well in their non-conference schedule beating teams like minnesota duluth uh Saint, Saint Cloud. Cloud. Their their opening series was against UMass, who was number one at the time, and they swept them two nothing six three. Yeah. Uh, splitting against Saint Cloud, sweeping UMD, only losing losing three two to Michigan. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's a team that had five losses all season. Mm-hmm. Um. That is a powerhouse of a team. Yeah, it is. Then, then again, you know, North Dakota plays in arguably the toughest conference in the country. Almost every weekend this year has been a matchup of top ten opponents. Mm-hmm. Um, I think all but maybe two, two, three weekends for Western Michigan were, if it was a conference weekend, were against a, a top 20 opponent. The only time it wasn't when it was Miami and Colorado College. Mm-hmm. So... You know things like that build you up for tournaments like this, where you have to play your top level hockey more than often than you than not. Although all that being said, I think Minnesota State gets the win, and, and they're the my last team in the Final Four. Yep, and I have Mankato, so um, I think the only one we differ on is UMD Denver. So I have Michigan, UMD, Western, and Mankato. Yep, I have I, Michigan and Denver. Me, it doesn't matter who Mankato played. Uh, I had them moving on. I, it wouldn't have mattered to me that they're such a powerhouse of a team. I saw them in 2019, well, three, so three years ago now. Uh, but they were still just at the top of their game, and I think that was – Uh, I think it was. No, it would have been before. So, I think yeah, either 2018 or 2019, whatever. Um, but they were a powerhouse of a team. They were just inexperienced at the time. They were a really good team, and now they have that experience from the tournaments that they can draw off of that and be like, okay. Without really trying, I have the top four seeds in the tournament making the final four. I have all four. Number one seeds moving on to, to the the frozen four. Well, then we know you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think like maybe I put too much thought into it. It was less of a, a gut check, but it, it just seems like the matchups kind of lean that way. Um, the only one that I could see honestly being super duper 
mistaken on is the Western one because it was more the most heart pick as opposed to intelligence pick. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and maybe even North Dakota, Minnesota State, because I know the least amount about those two teams. North Dakota could come out of nowhere, kind of like they did in the NCHC, and, and, and win that game. Um, they're extremely well coached. They're a very talented team. But, you know, it, it, it's one of the, and I might adjust some of these picks on my own time for my own personal shenanigans as I see teams play and, and, and things like that. I, just, I don't know, like I said, I don't, Denver and Minnesota Duluth, neither one of them were able to come out with a sweep during the regular season. Right. It's a 50-50 game. I will happily be wrong on that game, either way. I, I just think that given the opportunity to come uh, avenge a loss and to make adjustments I th and the powerhouse of an offense, uh, offense that Denver has will prov be able to overcome Ryan Fanty one more time. I think that's going to be a heavy game. That's going to be a good game. That might be the game of the tournament, honestly, if it comes out to being the game. Yeah, it, it might be a better game than the national tournament game, or the national title I, game. Um, I mean, I think we'll uh, we'll revisit obviously uh, before the actual Frozen Four, but might as well we're this far into it. I was just gonna say we'll finish it and and we, yeah. we can we'll discuss next week. You know, the actual Frozen Four, and and, and we can make new picks for at least that part of the tournament when we get mm -hmm. there. But yeah. Uh, I have Michigan versus Denver. Uh, I th I want to give the edge to Denver, and I want to see Denver move on. Not just because I'm fed up with Michigan this year uh, as a whole, the, the, just the university in total. I, I yeah. care less what those jack wagons do over in Ann Arbor. Um, I heard Jim Harbaugh <laughs> again. Yeah. Uh, they already did. They extended him. Um, yeah. You know, Denver's got a solid goaltender. They have a, a high-powered offense. Really, at this point, you're, yes, there's a lot of draft picks on the U of M team. But Denver knows how to work teams. They, they know how to outwork you, outplay you in the, in the gritty spots. Um, the talent level between these two teams is pretty well even. One just has guys who are drafted already. The other doesn't. Mm -hmm. And even then, there's guys on the Denver team that are drafted. Uh, Carter Mazur is a guy who I believe was drafted by the Red Wings who's had a fantastic freshman season. Um, Bobby Brink, again, is once again, we're going to make this point, he's the leading point getter in college hockey. Um, he's, you know, the, he was the forward of the year. He was the player of the year, the NCHC. I think anyone from the NCHC could probably go be dropped into the Big Ten and they would compete for the conference title, the championship title, yep. oh, right absolutely. away and for years to come and, and would probably win it. Uh, that being, so, you know, with, with, with that stuff kind of in mind, U of M doesn't really scare me too much. They're, they're talented players, yes, but they're also inexperienced players. You know, all these big name guys that we talk about are only junior or er, freshmen and sophomores. Uh, Denver's been there, done that. Michigan mm -hmm. hasn't won a national title in the 16 team format. They haven't won an, a national title since the late 90s. Right. So to say that, yes, they make the tournament, they generally don't have a lot of deep runs in the tournament. This year could be different, but it could be they they run into a powerhouse like Denver. And yes, Denver is a powerhouse team. And, and Denver, I think, would win that game more often than that, probably seven times out of ten. I think, um, let's see. I think they made the Frozen Four when it was here in 2018. Michigan did. But they lost to Notre Dame. And then I know in 2011, Michigan made the Frozen Four, but they lost to UMD at the XL Energy Center, which was sweet. Uh, that, that was fun. 
Oh, so I, I'm just looking it up. Uh, UMass got revenge on UMD in the tw in last year's uh, semifinal for the prior year out mm -hmm. in Buffalo okay. uh, when when UMD beat them for the championship. Uh, as far as the matchup goes, I you know I have UMD, but regardless if it's UMD or Denver. I was going to put them getting through against Michigan. Oh, yeah. I, I, Western, I just, Western and UMD play such a similar style, and we were able to see that Western was able to have success against U, uh, U of M or Michigan. Uh, so I could definitely see UMD having similar success. Yeah, that one was a fairly easy one for me to pick. Obviously, having UMD, it's a little bit of a homer, but at the same time, the conference, the experience – the style of play that we play. I don't think these kids are ready for it. And if UMD is the the team to go into the frozen four from the Loveland regional, there's a five, two loss that's hanging over their heads. And if I'm a player, I'm going to be pissed. And I am not going to want to let that happen again. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think they would. I really don't think they would. Uh, they respond pretty well. A lot of tape, a lot of talk about Michigan, a lot of non-talk about our conference. Uh, just in college hockey, it's basically Michigan. Yeah. It because of it has been all, all year all these draft picks and, and whatever. And you look at all the polls that have come out throughout the whole year, Michigan's on top, even Butchergrass, he's on the bandwagon. And it's like, come on, dude. Like, look, let's, let's be realistic here. There's better teams uh, out there. So either way, uh, uh, from the top half of the bracket, we have an NCHC team coming out. You have Denver, I have UMD. That's just the way that it is. And then Western Michigan and Minnesota State is who I have. Oh, this one, this one's hard for me. Mm -hmm. it, it's again one of those situations where I know, without a doubt, Western has the talent, the ability to beat Minnesota State, but they have to play their best hockey. They have to be able to limit mistakes, stay out of the penalty box, and play solid, sound defense. That being said, going into it, they will have, if all things shake out, they would have a week to prepare for Minnesota State. And there is a lot to watch on Minnesota State. Mm -hmm. There's a whole season's worth of tape. You can watch their best games and see what they do right, See, see find a couple things they do wrong. And probably spend more time preparing for Minnesota State than you do the other two teams. I don't want to be a full homer. And I, and I want it to be logical. But you have to pick your team. Like, and, and like I said, there's a case to be made. Western has had this weird ability to show up and show out when it's the number one, the number two number three, four team in the country. Mm -hmm. well, guess what? Everybody is that team this week. They're in this tournament. There's no easy games. You get it. You got to get it together. You got to figure it out. And you got to play four of the best hockey games you've ever played in your life. And if they do it, there's nobody that can beat Western Michigan. I 100% I fully believe that. And, and I will not doubt my team and I'm putting my team, Western Michigan, in their first ever NCAA finals appearance to play Denver. And I will give you a little bit of logic for that because I also had Western Michigan winning. Uh, Mankato swept us 2-1 and 3 nothing. The difference that I have between UMD and Western Michigan is you have more offensive firepower than we do. UMD is not an offensive firepower team. It's we're an opportunistic team. Oh yeah, for sure. 
we play similar styles, but you have way more offensive weapons than we do. Yes, I, I like, agree with that. We have we have offensive weapons up and down our lineup. The, it, it, we we don't have a one and two power play. We have a power play one and a power play A. Because if you look at the two power play units that we send out more often than not, they're almost mirrors of each other. It's different mm-hmm. guys, but it, they're mirrors of each other. Ethan Frank on the left is power play one. Ronnie Adder on the left is power play A. Mm-hmm. Uh, Michael Joyo runs power play one from the point. Of, I think Aiden Fulp, so we have two defensemen on our power play A, runs the point on that one. And then you have Drew Warad in the middle for one. And I think it's, I think, I think Glover, a freshman is, or a sophomore is on that second power play unit and goes to the front of the net. Josh Basalt and uh, Cole Gallant do similar things on the, the right side of the power play unit. So, I mean, they're, they're a mirror image of each other. Yeah, so that that's my logic of that. Like, we played Mankato super close. But we're an opportunistic team. We have some guys that can fire it, but our power play was not very good for the first half of the year, if not two-thirds of the year. Finally started coming on. Western has that power play firepower. It has a very good power play. Uh and you make the most of your opportunities. I don't think Mankato is that good of a defensive team, partly because they haven't had to be overall this year. Um, And yeah, they swept us early in the year when we're not quite on our game, but still for it to be that close, I... I also feel like Minnesota State's a team that takes a pretty good number of penalties. Um, I, I think they're an aggressive team and being aggressive and trying to create turnovers, that's where you get into trouble too. That, that's what leads to a lot of Western's penalties. We, we, if we can stay, if we could have our offense and like 75% of the Minnesota Duluth defense, because honestly, I, I feel like your guys' defensive style is probably one of the, and defensive play has been the best that I've seen this year. So if we could incorporate some of what you guys do well defensively, but keep what we do well offensively and and work on that middle zone of, for transitions and stuff, Western would be a, a dynamite team. Um, I have an all NCHC finals for the national championship, and I believe you might as well, but you have UMD versus Western, I have Denver versus Western. Mm-hmm. I have two... Two of the highest scoring offenses in the country taking on each other. Denver won three out of four in the regular season. It's a matchup we did not get to see in the NCHC frozen faceoff. Um, I would love to see this matchup personally because I want another shot at Denver. And I know that Western probably does too. I mean, honestly, I don't think Western really cares who they play if they got to this point. And I think if it's an NCHC matchup, it tends to potentially maybe lean more in our favor. Um, just because I, th- I think the same thing that I saw in Denver versus Minnesota Duluth, because I could easily see Duluth winning and getting to the same point. I could easily see it being Western versus Duluth like you have it. Yeah. Yeah, the, the same same here. Uh, I see the same chance of Western winning that game as I did Denver. I, Denver and Western play a similar offense. Western and Duluth play a similar defense. Um, you guys are a little more sound in your defense. We're a little bit more aggressive and, and want to get to that transition game a little bit too quick sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're, Western is... One of the oldest teams in the NCH or in the NCAA, as far as age wise goes, we're one of the tallest teams in the NCAA. We're one of the heaviest teams in the NCAA. We're gonna lean on people. We're gonna put them in the boards. We're gonna play those dirty areas. It's it's a style that can lead to success, 
but you have to limit the turnovers in your own zone and, and watch that defensive aggression. Um, this is a Western team that I think 100% has the ability, if they play their game, to win a national title. And that's why Western will be my pick to win the national championship this year. And I, uh, of course, went the the opposite. Uh, I said 3-1 UMD. Uh, that was more of a, a homer pick, but it was the... kind of based off of what Saturday's game was based off the defensive style and and then you know I we're not going to shut you out we're just not going to shut you out I think that third goal would be an empty netter that's how I would see it and I was just looking at the penalty summary from Saturday's game. It was 3-3. Each team took three penalties. Uh, you guys took three tripping minors. We had a goalie interference. We had too many men, and then we had a, a boarding penalty. Which a lot of people were kind of upset about that boarding penalty. Um, just because of the way... They had called the one against North Dakota the night before. Um, mm-hmm. Many people saying because that one was called a major, the one against you guys should have been called one too, which I wouldn't have minded. Um, right. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it's it's always like it, and that's one thing that bugs me about people. It's like it's hard. It's like no, it's like you got to look at it ob- objectively. Now, and, if it goes away, you're not going to mind, but. I, I did kind of see where where a lot of people were coming from in the Saturday, leaning more towards a major because it was the play John. It, it was the same player who got hit in both instances, uh, Josh Basalt. Uh, his uh, he's his, like I'm gonna need to take about two weeks off and then I'm gonna, just gonna quit. His, his back was more to the UMD player than it was the North Dakota player. Um, he had been in that position for a little bit longer the Duluth player may have come from further away. It, they were both similar plays, and, and I think if you had called either a minor, both should be a minor. And mm-hmm. I do get kind of where the people are coming from that, well, if this was a major, this should be too. Mm-hmm. But I, I think that's the difference. I mean, I think, I'm pretty sure it was different goalie, or uh, refing crews from, so. or maybe it was a combination of refing crews from our finale or our semifinal and your semifinal but i'm pretty sure it was a different crew from the western north dakota semifinal to the championship crew and that yeah. might just be a difference of them looking at the play so they could have easily have called the one friday night a minor and, and that one a major so, mm-hmm. but but yeah i mean it, it's gonna i think it's gonna be a really good tournament uh i can't wait to start watching games when thursday yep thursday and thursday at noon i believe is the first game uh thursday at that is minnesota state versus harvard it looks like yeah i think uh i think it should noon three six and nine or something like that should be well within my uh youtube live tv free trial and i'm really they might not like me at work because there's gonna be a few people in but i'm throwing that thing on the big tv and i'm so annoyed that college hockey western plays northeastern at noon on friday your game's at least at three o'clock on thursday that's near the end of the day well my game is at noon well yeah your time it's it's eleven o'clock, so I'm gonna be at lunch. Okay, so your game's at two o'clock your time. Yeah, two o'clock. The one the one game oh I well I guess that one's on ESPN two as well. I thought that but I'm like for whatever reason I read ESPN two, ESPN U, ESPN U, ESPN U, and I'm like, of course they put Michigan expecting them to win on ESPN2. 
I was, I was like, really? <laughs> but if you win, then Sunday you're on ESPN too. Yep. At four or six thirty. Mm-hmm. But you know you're going to be the four four o'clock game if Michigan wins. Ugh. Michigan. You, you know that. Yeah. Like it's not even. I'm not close. happy about that either because it's my grocery shopping day. That's my grocery shopping time. Anyway, it's fine. I will find a way to walk through Walmart with my headphones on and my phone in the little child spot of the cart, and people just have to watch me. Watch for me. I'm not looking at you. I'm watching hockey, people. Get out of my way. Yeah, it's, uh, it's fine. Uh, I believe this will be a hard record to beat, but that was about a two-hour show. Yeah, it was. <laughs> um, granted, we did not pick the regions that teams would be in, but I'm going to go on a limb and say that our show was better than the selection show, which I've heard many complaints about. We actually discussed all 16 teams on like said selection show um, and mentioned oh. them all by name, even though I continuously called Minnesota State Minnesota from time to time, but you knew who I was talking about, so it's fine. Context yeah. clues, people. Context clues. Learn how to use them. So basically what you're saying, it was the Michigan selection show. Michigan and Minnesota selection show. Uh, probably. I, I believe there was like very... I'm pretty sure they, they said that there was one region that wasn't even mentioned for some that reason. Probably. I know they mentioned the Western one, or they at least showed it and said Western Michigan a couple times. Oh, man. I don't even know which region you could not mention because... You got. I mean, you should mention all of them, but there there was people who were heard about something. I know, but you it might got, have been. You, it might have been the the, the Loveland one, which doesn't make any sense because you have a team that's made the last four Frozen Fours in there and won two out of the last four, yeah. but and two teams that have won three out of the last four national championships. I, I, I don't know what I, to tell you. I don't know what to tell you, buddy. I will it's say, ESPN. That, that's what you can tell me. It's ESPN. <laughs> Here are some fun facts about the tournament that I have mentioned to you off show. And I even tweeted about on the show's Twitter page, uh, Twitter account. There is a potentiality. I don't know if that's a real word, but I'm going to go with it. That Minnesota Duluth could play the same th- three teams in the NCAA tournament that they played in the NCHC tournament, provided that Denver and Duluth both win round one. Mm -hmm. St. Cloud State and Duluth make it out of their regional, and Western and Duluth make it to the final uh, championship game. It would be the same three teams in a slightly different order because you guys had to beat St. Cloud to play Denver and Denver to play Western. But it it makes me chuckle. Uh, there is. I think that would be the first time. Oh, well, I'm not going to state this as fact, but I think that would probably be the first time ever that that were to happen. Uh, there is a possibility for an all NCHC Frozen Four, or Final Four, Frozen Four, whatever you want to call it, which honestly is not outside of the realm of possibilities. Um, likelihood. Not very high, but not impossible with the way that teams have been playing. I give about 25% chance. And I think the other, like, I mean, that's something interesting. Western could potentially also have a very similar path to a national title that they had in the NCHC, uh, and that they could be, they could have to play North Dakota and UMD again, but that would be North Dakota getting out of its regional and once again Duluth. And Western both making it to the uh, championship finals. And if only Duluth and St. Cloud had been in opposite brackets. Had been in the end. Uh, switched those two. Because we could have had the same four teams make the Frozen Four and the Final Four in the NCAA tournament. And that would just be incredible. To even that, For even that to be a possibility would have been incredible. And that would have... Again, back to recruiting. Oh, 
you're thinking about going to the BC and BU, well, take a look here. You we can uh, any one of these four teams and have a chance to compete for a national title. Yeah, like you, you have a very, very good chance. And even now, you pick any one of these five teams, and you have a very, very good chance of you're winning. Play, you're playing a longer season, for sure. Um, you now again, like the, like I said, those those situations are kind of everything has to fall in place in, in a very, very particular manner. But anytime you have this many teams in a tournament of this few teams, it, it, it the possibility exists. And when the teams are as good as the teams are this year, I think it raises the probability that such a thing could happen. Mm -hmm. And so I would not honestly be overwhelmingly surprised if somehow it managed to be St. Cloud, Duluth, Western, North Dakota in the Final Four, or St. Cloud, Denver, Western, North Dakota in the Final Four. I, it could happen. Yeah, it would. It wouldn't surprise. It wouldn't surprise either of us or anybody that follows the NCHC closely. Um, and yes, it, we I, might I, be home conference homers, but. It's a possibility, so suck it, other conference nerds. Fight us. <laughs> and and with that note, I believe that'll wrap up this show. Um, if you watched on Twitter, or er, not Twitter, this is Twitch. My words suck at being words today. We appreciate you. We're doing so well for so long. <laughs> it's a two-hour show, Michael. Calm down. I'm going to mess up from time to time. It's so long. <laughs> Um, I don't, uh, I don't think this one's going to make it to, to the YouTubes. I kind of want it to just for the debauchery. Fine. It will then. Uh, I think it'll start out with like my chest in the camera, moving my ethernet cable from my Xbox to my computer. Um, if it makes it to YouTube, then you'll see this part and you can click on the subscribe button or the like button or the dislike button. There's buttons there. Click on them if you want to. Um, if you don't want to, that's fine too. I don't, this, this is just for, for funsies as far as I'm concerned. Um, if it becomes something, it becomes something. I'm not gonna really, you know, be upset either way. If we tickled your funny bone and you feel so inclined to want to let us know, there's some places you can do that are Twitter accounts, which are now, right there, other way, and then right there, uh, the show also has one. It is Goldhorn's, or Goldhorn Fight Song, G-O-A-L-H-R-N-F-I-G-H-T-S-N-G, at Twitter. Or you can email the, the show at Goldhorn's and Face Fight Songs at Gmail. Yep, those words didn't work either, but you got the point. And if it makes it to YouTube, they'll be in the description box that goes somewhere. Um, we promise next week we'll be better. <laughs> I promise next week I will try to be better. I don't know that it will be. Oh, that's on you. That great. You did, I, you did. I can only give you the best of that day. I can always give you my best, but that doesn't mean... My best will always be my best, but it's the best I can give you on that day. Fair enough. If any of that made sense. Cause it made enough sense to me. Which... It did, but I don't know if it came out this way the way I wanted it to. Well, if it made sense to me, I don't know how well that uh, translate to, translates to anyone in general anyway. So. All right. We, uh, gonna, done now. Okay, bye. Yeah. <laughs>